In the name of the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I must confess that sometimes when one follows the trajectory of the readings, and you put them together in their context, they are very emotionally laden. They tug at the spirit. So thank you, Father, for putting that first part of the gospel with this one. Those events presented to us by the gospel are emotionally laden. It's Passover week, that holiest of all festivals in the Jewish faith commemorating the liberation of the people from the yoke of oppression in Egypt. It is also Wednesday of the week of Jesus' Passion. To set it in sharper context, it's two days, two days before the Friday on which Jesus would be crucified. That's the trajectory. And Jesus is in the temple. And he has become the focus of the religious leaders. But their minds and their energies are intent not upon the holiness of those solemn days, the most holy of their days. The scriptures tell us that their focus, their focus was centered on plotting Jesus' murder an increasing undercurrent of resentment and animosity and venom, all aimed at Jesus. Why? One might well ask. Well, for one thing, his teaching of sacred scripture was contrary to their teaching, and that irritated them. For another, he was more popular among the people than they were, and that was hard for them to abide because their egos convinced them that they needed to be supreme. After all, they were the officials of the church. And Jesus demonstrated healing powers and abilities that they couldn't even conceive of. So let's take a look at how this develops. Sunday, which we refer to as Palm Sunday, Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem. He was hailed as Messiah by the multitudes, the long-expected one who would come to establish Israel in freedom and liberty, make all things right. And what did he do when he entered the city? Well, on Monday, he went to the temple. And he found the temple courts to be filled with money changers and merchants. They were selling oxen, and sheep and doves, you imagine the scene, all busily conducting their financial exploitation of would-be worshippers at that most holy place. And it was crowded. People came from all the then known world to the center of the faith to worship at that holy feast. Can you imagine Jesus' emotional distress at this desecration? Think about it. His felt anger at the injustice of those taking advantage of these vulnerable people at the temple. Can you imagine, get a sense of how this must have grieved the heart of our Lord, moving him into action, overturning the tables and benches, pouring out the money changers, stacks of money, driving them out of the temple. And those officials, the church officials who profited from restricting access to these people for prayer and worshiping God's presence there unless they first paid exorbitant prices for the sacrifices because, you know, these were all inflated. They were furious, especially because Jesus did this at Passover when people came from everywhere and the leaders made their most money. It was the most financially lucrative time. 
And so there was further confrontation on Tuesday. As they posed a series of trick questions to Jesus, first they attempted to trip him up politically, and then theologically with a major doctrinal issue. And what was his response? Through the use of parables, Jesus urged them, tried to encourage them to reassess their attitudes and their practices. He said to those leaders, you know, your current actions are inconsistent with your call to holiness of life. Think about it. You act like sons that say you'll obey and don't. Or like tenant farmers who lease out a farm and then instead of paying the dues, they kill the servants as well as the son of the one who leased it to them. Or again, like guests invited by their king to the wedding banquet of his son, and they disappoint and insult the monarch, first by refusing to come, and eventually the one who shows up refused to clothe himself with the required robes of righteousness. Our Lord tried, yes, he tried to assure them that there was still time for amendment of life. Civil hope. There was still opportunity to accept the offer of salvation, but to no avail. Can you imagine Jesus' frustration? Some of these very people whom he had come to save, those were the people who were so unrelentingly intent on trying to discredit him and we're doing so precisely at the time when he was most vulnerable, staying true to his mission with single-minded faithfulness, continuing his incarnational purpose. That's why he came into the world, teaching, healing, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And that's how Tuesday ends. And now it's Wednesday. And our Lord, on Tuesday evening, had gone to the home of his friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, spent the night there. And on Wednesday, he has returned with his disciples to the city, and he goes to the temple. They're waiting for him. See, word had reached the Pharisees that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees along with the Herodians, and so they all got together to discuss one more approach. They're determined. And out of that little conclave emerges the determination to probe the spiritual dimension again. And this time, this time they've come up with a tactic calculated to put Jesus in a disadvantaged position in relationship to Mosaic law. They're pretty clever. You see, they recall that Jesus had said to the multitudes, you've heard it said long ago that eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them the other cheek also. That's not what Moses told. And also you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. See, the Pharisees interpreted these teachings of Jesus as something beyond Mosaic law, contradictory to it. They saw him as setting himself up as a new authority, diminishing the role of Moses. But was that really true? Actually, it was furthest from the truth. Had they forgotten that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had said, I want you to know this. I have come not to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. I tell you, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter shall in any case be removed from
from the law until all is accomplished. But the approach of the Pharisees is something like this. Uh, since Jesus is a teacher with this new type of message, turning the other cheek, loving enemies, we could get him to just mention some other unorthodox law. And that would certainly discredit him with the people. And so they pose the question, we know that you don't regard people. You're pretty clever, of course. So which is the greatest commandment in the law? And with absolutely no hesitation, Jesus says to them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This, this is the first and great commandment. What an answer. What an answer. You see what Jesus did there? He quoted Moses. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 5. He actually quoted Moses. He did exactly the opposite of what they had hoped and what they had plotted and wanted him to do. They wanted Moses around, the, they wanted Jesus to say something that would supersede Moses, but Jesus not only quoted Moses, he quoted the most familiar thing that Moses ever wrote and handed to them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's the context. That was the most familiar scripture to all of those Jews, and it continues the same to this very day. Jesus affirmed solidarity with Moses, and he quotes to these experts in the Torah, the one legal theological verse that was most familiar to all of them. He affirms to them what they already knew, that the number one thing is to love God unswervingly with one's whole being, your heart, one's soul, and one's mind. This was to be their sole binding focus, the one supreme requirement of the faith. It is ours also. Our intellectual dimension, our emotional, our volitional, our physical dimensions of self, all must come together, focused on loving with our total being, all that we are, loving God. And notice these things are not all pushed together. It doesn't say... Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. It doesn't say that. It's not conflated or blended together. They're identified individually. It says literally that you are to love the Lord your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole mind. It's difficult. In fact, one of the rabbis, Rambam, says that's not possible. You see, God is not looking for people who go through religious rituals superficially. God desires people who love him with one's whole being, and Jesus did not stop there. Jesus went a step further and directed their attention to their holiness code in the book of Leviticus. It's mostly a book of rules, rules and more rules. They were given to Moses by God for the people to govern them, themselves in their daily lives. There are laws about which animals are to be used for food, laws of motherhood about not speaking bad words against a person who is deaf, not putting an obstacle in front of a blind person to make them fall down. Laws about how to test for leprosy, along with the procedure for cleansing a leper. Laws, reading it literally, for removing leprosy from the walls of a house. Here they're talking about removing mold from a house. You see, you get the picture. It's, it gets really interesting, though, that when we get to chapter 19, here's how it begins. The Lord said to Moses, 
speak to Israel's people, they must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. You must tell them that. This is God, the all holy one who is speaking to Moses. And at verse 18, here is what God says. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, directly from the all holy one. And this is the very thing Jesus said to the Pharisees. He told them that loving your neighbor as yourself was second only to loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And if perchance they might say, well, yes, Moses, but this relates to our own Jewish people, you know, not to the others, the Goim, the Gentiles. But the Lord had that covered also. At verse 34, same chapter, God spells it out. He says, You shall treat the alien who resides with you no differently than the natives born among you. You shall love the alien as yourself. And why? For you too were once aliens in the land of Egypt. I, the Lord, am your God. So what does that say to us? Well, we are not different today from the church of the Old Testament. We need laws to govern our everyday issues and rules to manage how we function within the church and the rest of the world. That's fine. It is as it should be. But let's prioritize things the way Jesus told us to. That's who we are called to be. That is, in a nutshell, our holiness code. I believe our call is to follow in the footsteps of the one who stood there in the temple in the presence of his accusers and his enemies and steadfastly declared love, love, the be all and the end all. That, that my friends, was his consistent message. And so when you come right down to it, our gospel text is about love. But it's about a divine kind of love. Love God, love one's fellow being. And we all know that one night later, Thursday, at the Passover supper in the upper room, our Lord would say to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. That's our holiness code. And so with his grace and love working within us, I want to share with you a benediction that I came across recently in a book of prayers. It's called the Black Rock Prayer Book. You're probably familiar with it already. But to my mind, this benediction passes out for us our Lord's loving command. And here it is. The world now is too dangerous and too beautiful for anything but love. May your eyes be so blessed that you see God in everyone. Your ears so you hear the cry of the poor. May your hands be so blessed that everything you touch is a sacrament your lips so that you speak nothing but the truth with love. May your feet be so blessed that you run to those who need you, and may your heart be so open, so set on fire, that your love, your love, changes everything. And hold always in your heart the mind, the blessing of the God who created you, loves you, and sustains you is and shall be with you now and always. Amen.